Oh, sorry, let me put this on. Is that okay? Okay. Um, from the previous presentation, I think looking at, uh, we were looking at uh, sort of uh, economic contribution. Mine goes a bit back a bit to an earlier stage when uh, children are uh, at sort of a younger age when they're at school. Um, so I've been part of many research projects where we've looked at uh, the Bangladeshi community and uh, looking at second, third generation uh, children and seeing what sort of contributes to their learning at school. Um, and what sort of barriers do they face and what sort of um, messages are they picking up about their own uh, identities uh, as sort of Bangladeshi, British, British Bangladeshi, um, you know, how, how do they see themselves as learners? So my, my presentation is based in the education um, discipline and uh, so uh, I've just, last year I completed my PhD and so most of what I'm going to say uh, today is based on the research that I've done uh, for the PhD. So I was looking at three generation families um, and in terms of uh, the aim, uh, obviously to look at the three generation families because that hasn't been done before and when you look at uh, grandparents and the research that's done around grandparents, it's always done uh, from the psychology uh, discipline where you look at the role of the grandparents as carers and um, a lot of the times when they become sole carers because the families are in difficulty, uh, the parents are in difficulty. Uh, so my um, research, I felt that there was uh, filling a gap in the research. Uh, also, I am part of uh, that generation. So my parents came here as the first generation. I am the second generation raising third generation children. Um, my main, um, in a way, my main um, focus was looking through my experience of growing up here and going through the education system, uh, being part of a very active community, uh, the Bangladeshi community, uh, how could I contribute to children's learning um, and also my backgrounds in teaching, so I was a secondary school teacher um, and currently I run parenting programs. So in a way, how, how can I make a, a difference to the lives of young people and to uh, help them raise in a way uh, a, an identity that would be uh, not only acceptable to the community around them but something that they can be uh, proud of. Um, so we, this, this came, uh, my PhD came uh, after a series of research projects that we did uh, in Tower Hamlets and it started off with looking at grandparents and the role that grandparents played in at home with the grandchildren and we found that they did a lot of activities with the grandchildren whether they lived with them or uh, far away. So my particular uh, study uh, looked at, um, so the three questions I was really interested in uh, was to look at the change in parenting styles of uh, the first and the second generation um, and what, was some, what were some of the reasons for that uh, and that was done through interviews. So I, I interviewed the grandparents and the parents uh, to sort of uh, track their journey of coming here uh, I mean also um, for the second generation going through schooling here uh, and now raising their uh, children. But also um, how does language and cultural practices uh, impact on uh, shaping the learner identity of the young people um, and the relationship between the generations. So what kind of tensions or uh, sort of relationships do the generations have between them. Um, and most importantly, I think, uh, from my teaching background, is to see how much of this uh, are the teachers aware? Are the teachers aware of the knowledge that the children bring with them? Um, because there is a theory, a deficit model that we constantly work on, where children, we see uh, particular com uh, children from particular communities where teachers feel that they come um, kind of an empty slate. And uh, going back to the imperial and colonial kind of uh, discussion we were having earlier, we are here to give. As teachers, we are here to educate and to inform and to shape uh, these poor souls that come into our classrooms. Um, and I don't think that's because of particular communities. I think generally as a teaching profession, we kind of come with this expertise uh, that we'd like to do that. However, for certain communities, it, it has a greater impact than it would for other communities. Um, so, uh, again, I worked with the teachers. So 
I do, uh, as far as I know, not any research has been done where parents, grandparents, the children and the teachers have been involved in a particular uh, study. So I have uh, three children, um, so, sorry, trying not to jump. Uh, so obviously mine was a sociocultural uh, study and um, I spent a lot of time with them so my approach was from an ethnographic uh, perspective um, and I was looking at particular learning constructs that are normally talked about um, in schools and teacher training. So you have the uh, well-known scaffolding and then you have the guided participation um, but there were some others that I was quite interested in uh, which were uh, synergy uh, syncretism, so how do, how do uh, the families and the children syncretize their learning uh, coming from different um, community experiences as well as school experiences. The funds of knowledge, so what does it mean uh, when we say uh, funds of knowledge? Who has that funds of knowledge? Who carries that and who imparts it to who? Um, and the other one uh, which particularly I was interested in looking at the grandparents was prolepsis. So in a way how does knowledge get transmitted from one generation to the other? Uh, and what kind of knowledge is transmitted uh, at home uh, between the generations? So this is kind of all the theoretical framework that um, I was working uh, around. Um, so for my study, I had uh, three six to nine year old children who were uh, part of my uh, focus group. Um, so their, their mothers and their grandmothers um, and I also had two teachers who were involved. One teacher, which interestingly you'll see the data for, uh, taught uh, two of the children. And her perception uh, of the two children, and she herself is a Bangladeshi second generation um, teacher, who we see a lot of in schools now. So you'll see a lot of second generation uh, young people who have gone on to become teachers. But it's really interesting to see the role that they take on in the classroom and which part of their identity do they bring into the classroom and what do they decide to leave behind. Um, and I found that really, really fascinating. So in terms of, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, um, I'll be looking at how the children negotiate meaning between their mothers and grandmothers. Um, how do they actually, do, are they in control of, uh, and do they make an informed choice of how they interact with different adults? Uh, or are they under pressure? Is somebody else is choosing uh, how they interact? Or do they actually have that choice within themselves? Um, and again, uh, looking at the contribution that the grandmothers um, make using their funds of knowledge in facilitating children's, uh, how they explore their identity, particularly their learner identity. So this is something that I used uh, initially to uh, build a rapport with the families, uh, particularly the grandmothers. Um, and we use this, um, and I know it's really small, uh, but I'll explain just the gist of it. Um, with our first project, just to gauge what the grandparents are doing with their grandchildren. Um, and it was really interesting to see the whole range of activities that the children are doing with their grandparents. And grandparents are actually um, uh, sort of taking time out to do these meaningful activities with their uh, grandchildren. But interestingly, it was the languages... Um, that were being used with the grandchildren. So ma all the act majority of the activities are used in both Bangla and English. So they're using Bengali and English with their grandchildren. Um, but also there are other, uh, the Urdu and the uh, Arabic comes in uh, when it comes to watching particular movies, but also the faith aspect. So the faith identity of the children uh, are very much linked to the grandparents' interaction uh, as well with the uh, children. So in a way, I, I use the interviews uh, with the grandmothers and the mothers and this activity to form kind of an outer layer of uh, analysis for the families. Um, so when you look at the interviews, um, the grandmothers all shared kind of the, the, the trauma of moving from Bangladesh to here and the loss and sort of kind of the grief, uh, the grieving, there was a grieving period where they actually missed the extended family network, the support, uh, the familiarity, uh, the, the open space. So there was a lot of uh, things that they missed. So what is the point of Sileti? Like you would rather just... If they them. can't read in it, if they can't, yeah. Oh. Um. John Daniels, yeah. um, I really enjoyed that. Um, one anecdote from two observations. Um, 
thing about universities not accepting Bengali or um, other so-called community languages. Um, I was at a, a careers event for six formers and um, a careers teachers in the day they existed. Um, and the dean of admission to a medical school, a university not very far from here, said that he wouldn't accept Bengali as a language, he would accept French, and he would accept um, hitchhiking in the pool as a, a voluntary activity, but not helping grandma. Um, as a result of him saying that I cost him his job, which I'm extremely proud of, um, which I didn't think that was probably a discrimination. Um, but more generally, I just wanted to say, I think really interesting what you've done, but I think it would be nice to extend it and look at um, children in London schools, for example, who have a French-speaking, Portuguese-speaking or Spanish-speaking background, not from Spain, Portugal or France, but from Frankfurt, Africa and so on, and see what their language patterns are. And that kind of leads into a third thing, which is just, maybe we just need to stop using terms like bilingual and mm. mother tongue and start using the ugly word from linguistic plurilingual, because what we've got is children and adults yes. using different languages for different purposes, different contexts. And it reminds me of the sadly apocryphal story of the European king who used to make war in one language, love in another language, cook in another, pray in another, and talk to us all, of course, in a fifth language. And actually, there are lots of us who use different languages for different purposes. And understanding that is really helpful to, to your main point, which yeah. is the, what, how much of an asset yes. language yeah. diversity is in cognitive development. Mm. Really Thank you. Can we look over the last one? Uh, <coughs> I'd just like to respond to what, what you said about educational research. I mean, all the international uh, e educational research shows that if kids master bilingualism or more at a literate level, in other words, with reading, yes. which is makes it slightly difficult for Saleti. They do better in education generally, but also the, all the psychological tests show that they're more comfortable with their own mm. identity and the level of self-confidence and self their way to negotiate a multicultural world is improved. So, mm. you know, all, all the research shows that rationally uh, being uh, bilingual at a literate level mm -hmm. is important. And, and I, I can mention a personal case where a lecturer at UEL, a Russian lady, who speaks perfect English because she lectures at UEL, she was worried whether she should talk Russian at home to her daughter or uh, English to, you know, address that question. So she did the research, and all the research told her that she should speak Russian, Russian at home. So her daughter speaks Russian perfectly and, and reads it and goes to supplementary school and she's also very strong at English as well. Mm. So uh, all the, 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 the fundamental analysis <coughs> is there. The institutions are there but work imperfectly. So at parliamentary level, there's the uh, all parliamentary par group for modern languages chaired by Baroness Cousins. Mm. They produced a manifesto two years ago for the last election and all the facts and figures to argue for developing home and other languages are there. There was a debate in Parliament, uh, the House of Commons, on the 24th of March last year on lesser taught languages and the enthusiasm of the MPs that came was very strong. In uh, Tower Hamlets there's a, a Bangladeshi collective of governors yes. with 120 uh, Bangladeshi governors but they're up against the white British mafia on the governing bodies where, you know, bankers and other people are kind of parachuted in from yeah. Canary Wharf and so on. So the choice is for French and, and Spanish. Whereas the, the schools could also have a minority language tacked on at the end of the afternoon. The problem is most primary school teachers uh, have never taught yeah. the foreign language. So there's lots of structural problems, mm. but if the country wanted to solve those, there are the mechanisms to start to address it. And it can start in terms with the Bangladeshi community. Yeah. I mean, just interestingly, w the project we did uh, was to partner up community teachers with mainstream teachers. Um, and they're still continuing that partnership okay. where um, the mainstream teachers have recognized that the community teachers also bring a wealth of knowledge yeah. uh, in terms of how they teach and what well, they're able to. Book, the yes, interconnected the worlds. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, uh, and that's, these are sort of the simple ideas that we can, uh, and they're on your doorstep. So these community school te uh, schools are 
often on the doorsteps of uh, mainstream schools. However, the timings are not compatible, but you'll find that the community teachers would have to make more of a sacrifice to come into mainstream schools than the main mainstream teachers may have to, um, you know, the sacrifices they need to make. So it's, it's about understanding and also reaching out, uh, but most importantly, recognizing that we need to do that. So it's a recognition that we all have a part to play in safeguarding the whole child. Um, and I think as educators, and we're all educators in different ways, um, is to actually have the child in the middle rather than them trying to struggle to fit into all these different spaces uh, to help them in that process. Thank you very much. We, uh, we're running a bit late, so we have to swiftly move to the next session. Um, can I just invite uh, Dr. Nilpur Ahmed to come and get this ready while I change the battery? <laughs> try and make up some of the time on the agenda and speak a bit less. Um, and uh, this is a quote from one of the grandmothers where she says she came uh, and it was Christmas and obviously it gets dark very early. Um, and she didn't know what snow was, so it was a, a, a culture shock for her. And she wanted to uh, go back. And uh, when her husband asked her, um, how are you going to go back? She said, you know, the bus that goes from Bethnal Green uh, to somewhere, I'm just going to take that bus back. So she was, she was kind of very uh, lonely, um, but also very unfamiliar with the uh, context. However, all three uh, grandmothers also said how um, they made it their mission to, um, to kind of resolve why they came here. So they came here for a better life, but also to provide an education opportunity for their children. So they, they took that quite seriously. Um, but one of the things that they were all adamant about was that they didn't want the children to lose their culture, their language, and their history. Um, and they fought quite hard to um, maintain that. So they would, uh, you know, in the 80s, there weren't many community schools about. Uh, you didn't have your Bangla school, you didn't have the, you know, uh, supplementary education. So what they used to do is they used to do that at home. So they used to prioritize that knowledge and they had full faith in the school system to provide the, um, sort of the curriculum knowledge to their children. They never questioned the teachers. Um, they, they would go to the parents' evening, they would pick up their report and they would say, yes sir, no sir, thank you, well done. You know, the, the very um, sort of giving and gratitude that they had to the teachers. Uh, on the other hand, the teachers had the impression that these parents weren't very interested. So a lot of parents didn't go to parents' evening because of the language barrier, for one reason. The other reason they didn't go to the uh, eve, uh, parents' evening is what would they bring back? The teachers are doing a great job. The children are doing well. They're learning English. They're um, doing their uh, exams. So what more could they get from going to a parents' evening? But that was obviously interpreted by the school as uh, disinterest. You know, they, they weren't interested in the education of their children. They never used to ask questions. There wasn't much interaction from the parents uh, with the teachers. Um, so when I asked the grandparents about their views about their own children, as parents, uh, how did they see their daughters um, raising their grandchildren uh, and about um, sort of safeguarding their culture and language identity of their grandchildren? This was the response from one of the grandmothers. She said, uh, are, are they doing that? Are they maintaining uh, the hard work that we did? Are they teaching Bengali like that? Are they giving any importance to Bangla? They're not going to be able to speak Bangla. Do they realize that? Uh, they need to realize that, otherwise, where will they learn Bangla from? If they don't learn Bangla, where will they learn to s when, uh, sorry, where will they learn to speak to me? If they go to Bangladesh, they will not be able to speak, and then there will be difficulties. So they were very concerned about uh, my generation of parents, like my parents were about me. They, they, they really uh, were upset that we weren't um, maintaining the language. So what's our take on that as a middle generation? Uh, so when, we, when I spoke to the mothers, um, they, they f kind of, their role was more, um, how do I, it's kind of a bridge between the parent generation 
and the community that we have to survive in. So in a way, we need to prove to the teachers as the middle generation that we know what's expected from our children and they will do just as well as other children. So we will uh, make that, uh, you know, the contribution at home. But also the, the fact that English uh, is the currency. It is what our children need in order to succeed. So up under the age of three, yes, we may speak to them in Bangla. Um, some of these, uh, two of the parents actually didn't speak to, sorry, their children in Bangla. But one of the mothers specifically did because she thought that um, that would somehow sustain the Bangla as they got older. But what they found was as soon as they get to school, because of the lack of importance that's placed on community languages, the language just disappeared and the children wouldn't want to speak it at home. Uh, so there's a lot of other issues uh, that kind of dictate uh, the choice of language and the choice of um, interaction that we make at home and in the school. So again, uh, when, so for instance, I was able to sit Bangla uh, CSE at that time, O level uh, earlier, um, and get a grade which was kind of recognized as a language. If, if my children were to do that now, it's not recognized by the universities as a language, as a modern foreign language. It is, it is not counted as a GCSE, an A-level, because it's your mother tongue. And it's not just for Bangla, it's for anybody who has a native uh, language. Which would beg the question, why would a child choose a GCSE or an A-level that's not going to serve them later on? So again, children have chosen not to, so uh, the, you know, Interconnecting Worlds, the book that we have, when we asked some of the children, why would you do GCSE Bangla, they didn't see the importance. Uh, however, they also resented the fact that it's not recognized. So the second generation emphasizing the value of English for their children, it skips a generation with the third generation are resenting us because we haven't given them the bangla. So we kind of stuck uh, in, in a situation uh, as the middle generation. However, our reflection of uh, the role of grandmothers is um, here where one of the mothers is saying that Yes, yeah, she learns more with my mum. Uh, she's wonderful with them. She relaxes. She sings the folk songs. Um, you know, she uh, and and this granddaughter wants to spend a lot of time with the grandmother uh, because she's getting a lot of um, sort of the fun, learning through fun uh, aspect of um, her identity as a Bangladeshi. Um, here, the mother is not seeing that as learning as a teacher would as well. Um, here she's having fun she like, because she can get away with a lot of things. So with the grandmothers, it's seen as the child is able to get away with things that she's not necessarily able to get away with me as the mother. She has to sit at a desk and learn. And where is the idea coming from? Because I've transferred the school learning into the home. Yeah? So this, uh, trans you know, sort of the homeschool links, um, which I found really interesting. It's not really homeschool links, it's school home link. Uh, it's the school that tells us how to teach our children at home, but we don't have the opportunity to go to school and say, this is how my ch child learns better. Yeah? Uh, so that's kind of the dichotomy that the middle generation are in, uh, to be, whether to be a mother, uh, a teacher, uh, or a friend, or, you know, uh, w what role do we play? Um, interestingly, when you come to the role of the teachers, so Hasna is the Bangladeshi second generation um, young lady who was a teacher at the school. Um, and she had two children. She had Amina and um, Samiha. So when, she, when I asked her to describe these children, um, she described one very well uh, and, and saying that, you know, that her parents are um, they're bilingual, but they're also professional. Uh, she has a lot of uh, experiences. She goes on lots of trips. Um, she does a lot of extracurricular activities. That's your model kind of setting for a child in the eyes of a teacher. Educated parents who give a lot of experiences to uh, the young person. When, she, when I asked her to describe um, Samiha, who lived in an extended family with her uncles, aunts, grandparents, she had a different take on this child. Um, and I found this really interesting because she herself has come from that background and how she is judging this child as a, another teacher would. 
So what are we bringing as uh, bilingual teachers into the classroom? Um, so she actually went as far as to say that this child could possibly have SEN needs because her English, spoken English wasn't as fluent as it should be. Uh, and she put it down to because of the experiences in the home. Maybe because the other members of the family are not facilitating the type of knowledge that we would expect as a teacher. And we only, I mean, I only know uh, this child to be different because she was part of our previous projects. And then when I was showing the teacher the, some of the videos of what she does with her grandmother at home, the teacher changed her mind because the stuff she was doing with her grandma, she was gardening with her grandmother. She knew exactly which plants needed watering when, which plants were in the shade, which plant uh, grew at, in what season. Yeah? That science knowledge, she hasn't been able to share in her school context with the teacher. Um, and my reason was, why are our children holding this kind of information back? Where, why are they not sharing uh, these kind of experiences they're having with their family members uh, in the home, uh, I mean, in the school? Um, again, Jade's, uh, Jade is the other teacher, and her take on this child, Habib, uh, was that this grandmother actually has a lot of childcare uh, responsibilities for these grandchildren. So she's in school a lot, and she actually hangs around the playground quite a lot. So she drops them off in the morning and she'll pick them up after school. She goes on some of the school trips. Yet, um, the teacher has very little knowledge of this grandmother and some of the things that uh, she does with her um, grandson. And she knows she's smiley, she's friendly. Um, and I don't just blame the teachers for this. I think it's the kind of pressures we have within the school setting as well and the targets and all the uh, <coughs> things that we need to do, does it give us enough time to look at the child as a whole child? Uh, do we get the opportunity? However, uh, in other research that we've done, it is so easy to do because a lot of us have a bilingual assistant in the classroom, teaching assistant, yet they have never been used as a resource to maybe look at some of the material that we're using to uh, do the lessons in the classroom. So. This was kind of the view of the teachers uh, of the children. So I, I wanted to get down to a, a sort of a deeper level of um, why some of the things were happening. And I started to, uh, I analyzed the conversations. So that formed kind of the inner layer uh, of the analysis. Um, and as we know, you know, the, the uh, quote here is, children are not only influenced by the social context in which they develop, but their very development as humans is dependent on opportunities to participate with others, uh, notably parents, family members, peers and teachers, uh, in the activities that constitute the culture in which they grow up in. So some of the things I looked at was, uh, in the conversations, what was the turn taking like? Uh, who took more turns? Who spoke more? Who asked particular type of questions? What was the language being used? Um, when, or what sort of role did the child take in each of those interactions? Uh, the, the partnership that built on and while I was doing that I was looking at some of the learning constructs like, like guided, uh, guided participation, scaffolding, prolepsis, synergy uh, and those that I mentioned earlier. Um, and Vygotsky, uh, some of you maybe um, know him very well, um, he claims that you know, it happens on two, two planes, Charles' cu cultural development appears twice. Um, so it appears on a social plane and then on a psychological plane. So the, what the child sees and experiences, they develop that as an internal message. Um, and it's interesting that aspect because um, there was a, a conflict within a classroom where uh, we asked the teacher to visit the uh, bungla class that happens upstairs. So this class, bungla class, happens in a primary school and the teachers have never visited that uh, classroom. Um, so the, the children asked the teacher to visit and it was a big event. Uh, so when she came upstairs, the children were in their own kind of territory and something came up. So I'll, I was videoing the uh, event and, um, and something came up and then the child said, oh, uh, do you remember the time you chucked so-and-so out of the classroom because they spoke Bangla? And the teacher said, sorry, when did that happen? 
And then the child on went on to describe that particular incident and she said, could you please stop the video because I think there's a, a misunderstanding here. So the, the teacher was saying to the child, why would I ever do that? And she said, but you always do that. Um, and she said, but when do I do that? He said, when we talk about the uh, a topic and we talk in Bangla, you don't like it and you chuck us out. She said, no, I don't chuck you out because you're speaking Bangla. I chuck you out because you're talking when you shouldn't be talking. Right? So she, her impression was that these children are talking. But when I asked her, would you allow them to speak Bangla in the classroom? She said, no. Because that's kind of the rule in our school. Um, and I said, where is that rule written? It's not a rule that's written. We just encourage the children to speak English so that it doesn't exclude other children. Yeah? Uh, so it's, it's, it's again, um, in a way, uh, assuming that there will be conflict before it has even been tried. So when we introduce bilingual resources in the classroom and ask the teacher to um, seek the help of the bilingual assistant, the transformation was amazing. Everybody was included. Those who didn't speak English, the Afghani child brought in a poem that was similar in that language. So everybody was bringing in stuff that they could identify with. And then it was, obviously, the conclusion was, it's not exclusive, actually. It's inclusive when we're able to um, integrate children's identities and uh, cultural backgrounds uh, into the classroom. So I will move on pretty fast. I'm conscious of time. So what I did was, I, uh, it was a very tedious task. I looked at all the conversations and I counted the words um, and I counted turns um, and I counted the questions. So this is a reflection of uh, the data that came up. And um, I don't know if, if you can see the numbers, but I'll just quickly go through what that brought up for me. Um, the teachers uh, spoke twice as much as the children. Uh, in, all the, in all the activities, but also one of the teachers spoke four times more than the child. Uh, the authority of the teachers during the conversation was evident, so they were responsible for the task. They were the guides, they were the um, uh, adults with the funds of knowledge that was um, sort of guiding the young people through the puzzle activity, so it was a jigsaw puzzle um, uh, th through the activity. Um, 67, in one interaction there were 67 questions asked by the teacher in an hour and 15 minutes activity. Um, and Amina, the child only asked eight. And those were only for clarification, they weren't meaningful questions that she was asking, she was just clarifying what the teacher wanted. Uh, so the ratio of uh, words spoken is similar. Um, and uh, when it came to the mothers, if, uh, it, was, it was more equal. The children tend to ask more questions, uh, and uh, mothers and children had more of an equal relationship. However, the, the kind of questions that were again being asked by the mothers was very similar to the ones that were being asked by the teachers. So one simi similarity that was there was how uh, the teachers used the box as a guide, um, and the, teachers did, uh, the mothers did the same. This is uh, what we're going to use as a guide to see how we do the puzzle. Uh, which goes first, the corners or the middle, or where do you start, was very similar between the mothers uh, and the teachers. Um, uh, with the grandmothers, the ratio was very, e uh, sorry, the ratio was more equal. Um, the grandmothers did ask questions, but the children asked a lot more questions uh, and contributed more between the, uh, uh, when it was between them and the grandmothers. Um, so in order to look at the type of questions, uh, I looked at kind of the, um, what kind of questions were being asked? Are they rhetorical questions? Were they questions that were just asked for the sake of asking? Um, and I think the tables are a bit small here. Can you see them? So what I did was, this was kind of the turns. So in a way, how many turns did the uh, adult take before a child could come in? Um, and how many turns did the child take? So with the mother and grandmother, there was a, a many, I mean, a high percentage where teacher took a lot of turns. And within that, she would ask two or three questions, which, which required two or three different answers. It, they weren't kind of on the same topic. So that 
put the child in a lot of difficulty and that's why you have very brief responses uh, when they're responding to the teachers um, and the mothers. Um, so with the teachers, there was a lot of demand created um, by the teachers for the children to respond in a particular way and if they didn't, they were corrected. Um, and with the grandmothers, that didn't happen uh, as often. So here, if you look at the, one of the conversations between the teacher and uh, the child, so it says, what are you going to do? What is the puzzle of? The child says the world, and she re-emphasizes that. So again, going back to the box, so taking a couple of turns, then there's a, th a third turn, and the child is just responding by saying, um, oh, yes, no, yep. So it was very uh, brief in terms of the responses. However, when you look at the conversation between the mother and child, it's a bit more interactive um, and the child tends to take uh, a bit more of a lead. Um, but however, it, it's similar where the mother thinks that she's got to guide the child. So um, spread them out now, take it out, where should we start, what should we do? So not giving much room to the child to make up their own minds. Um, you look at the grandmother here, uh, the child becomes the teacher. So what I noticed with the grandmothers is that the children were very relaxed around the grandmother. The nature of questions um, were more for the, uh, so there was one time where the grandmother was just asking, so what do you see next? So what is next? So just encouraging the child to uh, make their own kind of decisions. Um, so here, uh, if you look at that, uh, also the language, with the mothers, they totally, the whole activity was done in English. There was no Bangla spoken whatsoever. Um, and with the grandmothers, majority of the times, uh, the grandmothers spoke in Bangla. Yeah? Um, so this is, the, this is the ratio of the words spoken in Bangla between the grandmothers and the children. Uh, so the capacity for the children to speak the language is there, even though it's rusty. Uh, they weren't fluent speakers, um, except for um, Amina. She was the uh, only one who was uh, from the extended, so, sorry, Samiha, who was from the extended family. She spoke fluent Bangla. However, she didn't speak any Bangla with her mum, who was also fluent in Bangla. But with the grandmother, the, the, they all spoke in Bangla, um, and the grandmothers coaxed it out of them. Uh, to speak it. Um, so in a way, they allowed uh, the children to enter the culture through their interaction. Um, so different cultures make meaning in different ways with different patterns of exchange, interaction. Uh, the children learn to live in different worlds. So our children are actually living in multiple worlds. So whose responsibility, whose responsibility is helping those children to bring it together? Who does that? So they go to state school, then they'll go to an evening class, then they come home. Um, and this triangle, actually there's nobody sitting in between bringing it all together. Each is saying to that child, there's a part of you that needs to stay behind. Yeah? Um, if anything, I think we found in the complementary school, the children are able to share parts of their identity a bit more than they are in the state school. Uh, and at home, um, they may do that, but it's not facilitated as such. The only place where I've seen that happen is with the grandmothers. So it was the child would open up to the grandparents, uh, the grandmother, where the grandmother will advise them how to behave in each of those settings. They'll say, in school you respect your teachers, in evening class you do this, you dress like this, at home you respect your parents. So that uh, consistent message is actually being given by the grandparent to that child. Yeah? Um, so the um, the crux of uh, so the message I kind of want to give from my study is that what I found was that the children were actually uh, making an informed choice about the way they are interacting with the different adults. They are uh, also in control uh, in the way they're interacting. So this learner flexibility, which I've, uh, the term that I introduced, is um, it's a real skill, it's a real skill and an asset within uh, third generation children that uh, I think we experienced some of when we were growing up, um, is the ability to say to the teacher, you know what, I'm going to let you do your job. 
I will just say the minimum, but I won't bring the activity to a standstill. I'm still contributing, I'm still doing the activity. However, I'm not going to challenge your authority because here I know if I was to challenge your authority, I may get into trouble. Yeah, it may not be recognized positively. So this child has chosen to do that. With the mother, they know they have a bit more leeway. They will challenge certain things. They will ask questions. They will negotiate a space for them where they are as much as part of the activity uh, as they can be. But with the grandmother, all guards are down. They are who they want to be. Um, and they are relaxed in that situation where they know they won't be judged. They know they won't be assessed. Um, and they know they don't have a target to fulfill because the parents are not rushing somewhere else. Um, so the grandparents have the time to actually invest in that relationship. So for me, the, 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 the fact that the prolepsis, the transmission of knowledge uh, that's happening between the grandparent and the grandchild uh, is invaluable. Uh, and the funds of knowledge that's being transferred and being recognized from the child um, really needs to be uh, somehow recognized by the <coughs> teaching profession but also by the grandparents themselves. I really find uh, through the research that we've been doing, the grandparents themselves are not appreciating that the role that they play. They see themselves as caregivers. They see themselves as having children, and I think I was having this conversation a bit earlier on as well. You know, I have my grandchildren, not I, as grandparents will say, uh, once a week, twice a week, um, and I'll try to make it enjoyable. However, if we were aware of the role that we play uh, as grandparents, I think we could do a lot more for our children uh, to give them that stability of identity that they require in order to face all the other challenges that they're facing in the other spaces and the simultaneous worlds that they're uh, living in. So, brings me to today's discussion. Um, where are the Bangladeshis in British society? So, we have moved uh, on. We are educating ourselves. The middle generation, as far as I know within my circle we are trying to educate ourselves, we are trying to um, get a better um, footing into the society. Uh, however, um, if we look at what we're losing in the process because we're not possibly valuing it, it it's, it's going to be a great loss for future generations. Um, so in a way the cognitive abilities of thir third generation children are greater in those who have um, their bilingual identities. Uh, the grandparents are a primary source in developing children's learner identities through building their funds of knowledge. And the grandparents are doing all these, you know, things that we, te we learn on teacher training, the scaffolding, the guided participation, and all the other things that we're learning in teacher training, the grandparents are doing through life experiences. Uh, they're sharing that with the grandchildren. And the grandparents are also the socializing agents and cultural and linguistic mediators. Uh, for the grandchildren. So they actually help the children to uh, mediate and navigate through the social complexities uh, around them. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we, the second generation, we're kind of uh, stuck in a way and we really need to maybe uh, find ourselves again. Uh, the fact that we're not speaking, uh, although we're fluent, we're not speaking any Bangla at home because things just get done quicker if I speak in English. Um, so these kind of things, um, in a way, it's not going to serve us well in the long run. Um, I have a couple more slides. So <coughs> also the teaching profession, the teachers need to recognize that what children bring into the classrooms uh, are a wealth of knowledge. And there are many, many, many opportunities where we can actually allow the children, when we send homework home, all we need to say is just ask a grandparent or a parent, is there something like this in your own culture, in your own uh, language? Yeah. So we did a, a song, Kajla um, Didi, in Bangla. Yeah. Similar version in What's Happened to Lulu is in English. And the child, the Afghani child brought something in. The Iran Iranian child, the Turkish child, every culture has a, a poem of loss. So they all brought that into the classroom and they had a field day just doing all the you know, metacognitive uh, things that we require them to do in that lesson. So this is very uh, kind of um, simplistic way of looking at things, but I think it can be done. Um, and also the role that the bilingual teachers play in the classroom. We have a wealth of funds of knowledge that we have 
we need to bring to the uh, staff room and the t uh, teacher trainings that we have, inset days that we have within the school, just to understand the way children learn because we've been through that experience ourselves. Yeah. So the question, uh, I guess I'd leave you guys to think about and maybe us all to think about is what will, it, what will being a Bangladeshi mean for fourth, fifth generation, future generation uh, in Britain? Because you know, our previous sense of knowledge, language, identity, our peculiar inheritance cannot be simply rubbed out of the history or story cancelled. Uh, what we have inherited as culture, as history, as language, as tradition, as a sense of identity is not destroyed but taken apart, <coughs> opened up to questioning, rewriting and rerouting. Um, and a bit of flavour of that we've got through um, Sadiq Khan's election campaign of what it means to be uh, a Pakistani, British, Bangladeshi mayor of London and how things were unpicked for him. Um, so that will always happen, but we have to find a way of rooting, finding a route that will keep the roots intact. So um, I'd like to finish with that, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments? Or uh, just one question <coughs> on language uh, in the sample you had it in terms of your own language skills. Yeah. With the Bangladeshi community, statistically, more people speak Sileti uh, rather than Bangla. But you chose Bangla just because uh, that was more practical for you to do the study that way or because Bangla gave you a written discipline too? Okay, no, uh, when I say Bangla in this context, it's Sileti. Okay. So the families were speaking Sileti, uh, although I'm not a Sileti speaker, um, the, the families were speaking Sileti during the activities. Okay. Yeah, so Bengali here is actually referring to Sileti. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question um, about um, the role of Bengali in schools. Um, all the issues, that you, I'm like you, I'm a second generation mother. Yes. My children don't speak a word of Bengali, yeah. and it's primarily my fault mm -hmm. because although me and my husband speak Bengali to each other, it's much quicker yes. than to do it in English. Yeah. And it's got to stage when I, even my mother speaks to them in English because it's quicker. Though the few words of Bengali they know they have picked up from yeah. her. Um, and that generation, you know, our, our mothers, their grandmothers, they won't be here in 15 years. That's right. Um, and this question is what is going to happen to our fourth, fifth, future generations in Britain? Um, yeah, it's good there's complementary education, but surely we have to root it back into schools. You know, we are taxpayers, right? Yeah. There are 500,000 of us in this country, 300,000 are probably in London. Um, why? I think it's a bigger policy. Yes. Yeah, policy yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, policy. that's fine. No. Um, yeah, yeah. But and the children, of course, they won't value it. If they know that we have very low uptake, and Mrs. Uh, and then it will go. No, they yeah. will why yeah. would they? Why would they yes. say that it's not going to be recognised for university? Yeah. Okay, GCSE is not such a big deal because it's the number of subjects. Yes. But why would you do an A level that a university is not going to recognise? That's of right. You do it. I can't fool the children for that. Yeah. It's the policy that's at fault. But what will happen to my children, my, ch well, my children's children? Yes, we need to keep that knowledge. It's our sense of identity. But you know what is dying? Children don't know it's about the 71 rule. Yes. They don't know their alphabet. Because with language comes a lot of other yeah. information. With language comes yeah. You lose your language, you lose your culture. Yeah. Um, and these are things that I've, um, the lady sitting next to me is a Bengali teacher in an East London school and I yeah. love her. Um, and we have huge issues from the Bengali children. They want to do like Spence, uh, French and Spanish, they don't yes. want to do Bengali. They come into lessons, they say, we don't speak Bengali at home. It's what's of value. Yeah, exactly. um, so it's a vicious circle in a way. Um, they don't do any passion for the language. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's where I put on my parenting hat, um, and it's how we sort of when, when we do the parenting courses. One of the things that we stress to parents is you've got to the foundation of any kind of parenting is to have uh, help your child to get an identity, and part of that identity is to know where you come from, uh, ethnicity, culture, spiritual roots. Uh, yeah, there isn't the time, which is why you need to root it back into the schools because the schools. There, yeah, a primary answer. In primary, I believe Bengali needs to be introduced because we have the alphabet set. Bengali was introduced in some schools uh, at primary during lunchtime. You know, uh, part of the curriculum was uh, for a while, I think. Just like out of hours. Yeah, out of hours. Um, 
and the children necessarily don't want to take it up because again it's you have the problem of um, people not valuing Sileti and not yeah and not uh, you know what's the point of my children speaking in Sileti that's not sort of the uh, the literal language uh, it, it doesn't matter what you know it doesn't matter whether you're speaking Sileti and Sileti did have a script so you know you putting the value into into that is really important so just because I don't speak the standard Bangla I shouldn't speak Bangla at home it, it, it's a myth that we need to there's a lot of myth busting we need to do as a community um, within ourselves so we need to start valuing it ourselves Absolutely. before Absolutely. others can value us Absolutely. because the school staff or school authority will turn around and say well we did have Bangla mm -hmm. not enough uptake so we can't put it on exactly. the timetable it needs to go yeah, yeah so it, it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation you got that video there? Hey. Speak up, please. Yes. So I taught in a school every time I was, and there were two good boy teachers, and the rest of us were teaching French, Spanish, Latin. Um, and we were just, we were outside of our little bubble. We were never allowed to speak with yeah. each other. And, uh, and we could see the other members of staff sort of giving us the looks like, why are you speaking your language? Yeah. Um, so it, it, I don't think it's just with Bengali, it was a case with every language you just got learned. And what I found in this particular school is there was a lot of emphasis on the movie, on learning it, on learning how to speak it, um, with emphasis on sility again, mm -hmm. because the vast majority of the kids got sility. So um, my experience is that, but even with adults, I find it difficult. Even when I'm in public, with yes. relatives, I am conscious of the third generation to speak yes. with me in public, uh, because people stare on the buses. So I feel like it's also to do with others reacting to you when you speak. It's a whole climate. I think the the climate of, um, in a way, integration and you know what what's seen as integration. Um, and one of the questions um, I had, for instance, the children uh, and there's a uh, you know the book that's on here. There's a couple at the, a few at the back. Uh, one of the questions we asked the children is, where do you speak Bangla in the school? And they said we speak it in the playground. Why do you speak it in the playground? Because it's open. No one can record or it's not it's. It, it's allowed. So why do you not? We, it took us a long time for, to get those children to feel that it was okay to uh, speak Bangla in the classroom. We took them to the main hall, which was bigger. They wouldn't. And they kept saying it's the walls. You know, so, so these unwritten uh, laws that we kind of make um, verbal contracts in a way that this isn't allowed. Uh, we, what, then what happens is when the children are speaking Bangla in the playground, they're speaking language of abuse. So they will swear at each other, they will teach each other inappropriate language. Um, whereas if you're able to bring that language into the classroom, you're teaching them, them academic uh, language, but also language of interaction. So they, then they have the confidence that they are able to speak to each other without offending each other. So, you know, th those kind of things, I think we, we need to really uh, look into. And per personally, I don't think enough research, uh, and somebody mentioned this earlier, is filtered down to, you know, we do these projects, research projects, in a few schools, uh, and then we leave. Um, it doesn't really change policy as such. So what we need to do is really highlight the schools that are uh, practicing these things as good practice, uh, and get them, them to uh, model it for the other other schools because I know in town hamlets the schools we did the research in they are still some continuing some of the good practice and particularly the teachers that were involved in the research the bilingual teachers they've really come out of their shell and said yeah we do have a purpose here we are we we have a, a, a funds of knowledge that the other teachers don't have we actually have resource uh, and and expertise that we need to share with our children give them the confidence so sometimes they think you know I'm I'm a Bengali speaking uh, person in front of a whole classroom, I'll be a role model to them. But I'm, I can't share a lot of that. I can't share my language with them. I, I can't share uh, how beautiful it is because when we use Bangla, they're able to understand some of the concepts in math that they weren't able to because they think in their minds they, there's so many words going around. You give one English word, they're thinking of all the Bangla words. 
Um, and so some of those words are easier to understand than the English words. So we're not giving the children to, you know, there's a whole cognitive gym, and that's something that I really want to look into, how bilingual children, multilingual children actually um, cope or uh, bring strength to uh, academia. I mean, how, how do they do that uh, and, and their academic uh, development? I have a list of other questions. I will possibly email you to the technological. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting about your research is things similar to my PhD at the moment, and look at these generations of these oh, wow. um, identity construction that are more theoretical based than <coughs> right. why. Yours is particularly mm -hmm. around education and sort of that yeah. setting. Um, one of the things I was thinking, actually, when you were talking about this third generation, in my family, I am that third generation, yeah. and I'm not six or seven, I'm 28. And um, so when you were talking about, um, you know, are you didn't understand more than they could speak, that's me. Yeah. You know, even at university, I don't have a space in which I can talk to my colleague mm. in my dad's language or in her family's language, I speak with who she speaks Yeah. Um, but we don't have a space to do that, and when you go home to do it, within your family, they look upon you badly because I speak like an English person. I can't put the accent on top. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm around um, like people my grandparents' age, you know, they're they not going to repeat, but they're making comments <coughs> yes. to me like, you know, why don't you learn your language? It's yeah. like, oh, I'm trying. I, yeah. I don't have the safe space in which I can use the skills that I've got mm. and I'm rapidly losing them. When I moved, when I moved um, to the West Midlands, and I was two and a half years old, I was fluent in the group because of the word English. Now I'm almost the other way around. Yeah. And um, you know, it's, it's very, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing bringing it into schools, but you need to have it. You know, a safe space. Multiple public yeah. hats. Yes. You know what I mean? There needs to be loads of places in which you yeah. can do that. So in my research, I'm looking at identity construction, and the thing I'm finding is over uh, multiple generations, 18 upwards, and I'm finding that moment and look at just females is that when people are at home they can be their Asian selves mm. and as soon as they leave the house yep. they're someone else as soon as they go to work or to school they mm. can learn English mm. so, so it's all these simultaneous worlds yeah what skills they have you know they're, having to, they're too busy having to fulfill their audience mm. so regardless whether they have the skills or not Mm. So but where does the my question is for the third generation where does the resentment lie not having that skill do you know what the most embarrassing thing I'm telling you guys anyway I was in Coventry City Centre the other day and this Asian woman stopped me and I'm pretty sure she was asking me where to get this from and didn't understand the word she was saying and the only reason I know she was asking about this because she said the word this in English my response was to head down and walk away in shame that's where my resentment comes from, is when you're thrown into a situation where people look... Who would you blame for not having that skill? Blame the parents. Yeah. That's the saddest thing. So yeah, just but there's so yeah. many different languages. Yeah. You can't learn all of them. So which one do you prioritize? No. That, 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 that Asian lady, what language do you think she will speak? Sorry, I can't hear her ask. That Asian lady in Coventry, what language do you think she will speak? Like. You can only learn one. Yeah. That's true. Yes, <coughs> so, so many Asian languages are quite similar, right? So I, I've been to a lot of events over so International Women's Week. I know it's a but I've been to Hindi, 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 i have been to hindi 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 i I'm starting to get a bit worried about the discussion and expectations of who we should be. I think we have to be really careful about identity yes. and the choices we have within you know, the culture and the informal educational system and the society considering politics at the moment. Because um, you know, in terms of, kind of, there's two pressures. One is to be able to speak English really well and fit in and use that language in the country which is become English. On the other hand, is the embarrassment of not being able to speak the language that your parents I think, you know, I don't feel that people should be pressured to kind of 
feel obligated to speak one or the other, and we, we have to give more choices to people. I mean, to be honest, England generally, in line with France and the European Union, is really the worst country for learning any foreign languages in the schooling system, and just culturally. Yeah. It's really, really bad. That comes from history, that comes from colonialism, that comes from many, many things. And the other thing I'm worried about, if you grow, grew up speaking Sileti, or depending on your social class from Bangladesh, we have to take into consideration as well, to learn standard Bengali, it seems to me, my experience, a foreign language, to be honest. It's not what you would have spoken at home. It's, a, it's quite, even compared to English, I have to say, quite a yeah. verified literary language. Yeah. So I think, you know, the kids feel on the one hand they have to know that, they get resentful because they don't, because they expect it to be Bengali, whatever that means as well. Because my father, you know, before 71, he was Pakistani. Before that, he was British Indian. And he came here in the 40s, and he spoke Urdu, he spoke uh, Bengali, and he spoke Hindi. Mm. Quite fluently, I don't know how he did it. I think my folks, that sorry. That period yeah. was very, very different. And then I think with the nationalist concept, the expectation now with Bangladeshis, and even Bengali language is not Bangladeshi. So I think it's very, very complex field. How, um, I agree with the institutions, what freedoms that they should give us, I think is a question, but very restricted in terms of the educational system for many, many things, not just education, not that, not that me with your artistic projects, but also just showing things about your country photographically. I'm shocked. They don't just really explore the kind of backgrounds of their students, where they've come from, what influence they have. Forget about language, even at that. So kids feel embarrassed because and I do think, and I'll say this quite strongly, I think a lot of people who don't speak another languages, I speak four languages, is, and I'm not, I think it's an English mentality, a British mentality, they're quite resentful for anybody speaking more than one language that is not English, and I'll be frank with you. Because I think we Google Translate now, so <laughs> everything will be sorted. <laughs> so I, just I to, just to clarify, I think for, I was coming from, a, from, from the language perspective, was, uh, from an education perspective, um, losing a skill set uh, within a child, um, it, it, I mean, if a child has the ability to speak two languages oh. from the start, why would we, because one of the children said that from a bilingual I've become a monolingual, why would we allow our children, and it's not just about language, it's the skills that come with the language for the cognitive development. So why, why would we, if it, was, if it wasn't Bangla and French or something else, we would make the effort. Maybe if I was French speaking, maybe I wouldn't make the effort. I mean, I don't know. So are we looking at another language of more value than the one we've come with? That's the question I have. So a child that has the opportunity in a household to be raised a bilingual, which brings with it cognitive, and it's been researched time and time again, that children are cognitively more able if they have a, a language, you know, so if they start off with very sound Bangla, for them to pick up English in another language, it's just, it's just like that. They would pick up other languages. Whereas if you're not strong in your home language, any other language becomes, you, you have neither. You don't have English properly and you don't have Bangla properly. So from an education perspective, it's to say to families and parents that it's so important that we recognize that we have the ability to raise our children as bilinguals not necessarily emphasizing the language as such, but it's the ability to raise them as bilinguals and give them that due right that they have to be better academics. I mean, they can, they can study better. They, can, they have skills that they, uh, a monolingual may not have. Just to say, so I'm, a, I'm an English language teacher, and the skill sets for different aspects of the language can be at different levels depending yes. on which skill you're doing. You can speak relatively fluently in terms of yeah. verbally, of a certain level and a certain dimension, but in terms of your writing... Writing could be different, yeah. So I think we have to be careful what bilingualism means or yeah. multilingualism. My first language in terms of operationally is English at a very high PhD level. Mm. Let's say, but my Bengali is not at that level because I don't use it use in that it, way yeah. in reality that I mean. Both are very important, but in reality, where I use it and how I use it, I lived in Italy five years. My Italian mm. is far better than my Bengali because I use it there for work, for many different things. So I think we need to be a bit more complex what language we're language, yeah. expressing. I think we'll go to Rifat then. Yeah. I, I just like no, to sorry. Yeah, sorry? That lady over there. Oh, sorry. Come back to you, yeah, sorry. 
And from the research, I'm not sure that's not something I looked at. Okay. But from personal experience, I can say that from my generation of parents that I know, it, it is a, a concern that so what is the point of Sileti? Like you would rather just if they them. can't read in it, if they can't, right. yeah. Okay. Um. John Daniels, okay. um, I really enjoyed that. Um, one anecdote from two observations. Um, the thing about universities not accepting Bengali or um, other so-called community languages. Um, I was at a, a careers event for six formers and um, uh, careers teachers and those that they existed. Um, and the dean of admission to a medical school, a university not very far from here, said that he wouldn't accept Bengali as a language, he would accept French, and he would accept um, hitchhiking into Nepal as a, a voluntary activity, but not helping grandma. Um, as a result of him saying that I cost him his job, which I'm extremely proud of, because I didn't think that was probably a consideration. Um, but more generally, I just wanted to say, I think really interesting what you've done, but I think it would be nice to extend it and look at um, children in London schools, for example, who have a French-speaking, Portuguese-speaking or Spanish-speaking background, not from Spain, Portugal or France, but from Frankfurt and Africa and so on, and see what their language patterns are. And that kind of leads into a third thing, which is just, maybe we just need to stop using terms like bilingual and mm. mother tongue, and start using the ugly word from linguistic plurilingual, because what we've got is children and adults mm. using different languages for different purposes, different contexts. And it reminds me of the sadly apocryphal story of the European king, used to make war in one language, love in another language, cooking in another, pray in another, and talk to us all, of course, in a fifth language. And actually, there are lots of us who use different languages for different purposes. And understanding that is really helpful to, to your main point, which yeah. is the, what, how much of an asset yes. language yeah. diversity is in cognitive development. Mm. Really Thank you. I think we'll go for the last one. Uh, <coughs> I'd just like to respond to what, what you said about educational research. I mean, all the international uh, ed educational research shows that if kids master bilingualism or more at a literate level, in other words with reading, yes. which is makes it slightly difficult for Sileti, they do better in education generally, but also the, all the psychological tests show that they're more comfortable with their own mm. identity and their level of self-confidence and self their way to negotiate a multicultural world is improved. So, you know, all, all the research shows that rationally 
uh, being uh, bilingual at a literate level mm -hmm. is, is important. And, and I, I can mention a personal case where a lecturer at UEL, a Russian lady, who speaks perfect English because she lectures at UEL, she was worried whether she should talk Russian at home to her daughter or uh, English to, you know, address mm -hmm. that question. So she did the research, and all the research told her that she should speak Russian, Russian at home. Mm -hmm. So her daughter speaks Russian perfectly and, and reads it and goes to supplementary school, and she's also very strong at English as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, all the, 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 the fundamental <coughs> analysis is there. The institutions are there, but work imperfectly. So at parliamentary level, because the uh, all parliamentary par group for modern languages chaired by Baroness Cousins. Mm -hmm. They produced a manifesto two years ago for the last election, and all the facts and figures to argue for developing home and other languages are there. There was a debate in Parliament, uh, the House of Commons, on the 24th of March last year on lesser taught languages, and the enthusiasm of the MPs that came mm -hmm. was very strong. In uh, Tower Hamlets, there's a, a Bangladeshi collective of governors yes. with 120 uh, Bangladeshi governors, but they're up against the white British mafia on the governing bodies where, you know, bankers and other people are kind of parachuted in from the yes. Canary Wharf and so on. So the choice is for French and, and Spanish. Whereas the, the schools could also have a minority language tacked on at the end of the afternoon. The problem is most primary school teachers have uh, never taught yes. the foreign language. So there's lots of structural problems, mm. but if the country wanted to solve those, there are the mechanisms to start to address it. And it can start in terms with the Bangladeshi community. Yes. I mean, just interestingly, w the project we did uh, was to partner up community teachers with mainstream teachers. Um, and they're still continuing that partnership okay. where um, the mainstream teachers have recognized that the community teachers also bring a wealth of knowledge yeah. uh, in terms of how they teach and what well, they're able to, book, yes, interconnected worlds, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, uh, and that's, these are sort of the simple ideas that we can, uh, and they're on your doorstep. So these community school te uh, schools are often on the doorsteps of uh, mainstream schools. However, the timings are not compatible, but you'll find that the community teachers would have to make more of a sacrifice to come into mainstream schools, then the main mainstream teachers may have to, um, you know, the sacrifices they need to make. So it's, it's about understanding and also reaching out, uh, but most importantly, recognizing that we need to do that. So it's the recognition that we all have a part to play in safeguarding the whole child. Um, and I think as educators, and, and we're all educators in different ways, um, is to actually have the child in the middle rather than them trying to struggle to fit into all these different spaces uh, to help them in that process.